good morning students yesterday we were discussing this human auditory response and you can see on the slide that 0.2 nanobars pressure that level corresponds to the threshold of hearing which gets mentioned as 0 dbs 0 db with respect to sound uh, i had told you yesterday that uh, Cats, dogs, tigers, cheetahs, lions, even wolves, jackals, dogs, all these animals, they have a sensitivity which is much larger than human beings' ears response, which means these animals can listen to sounds which are smaller than this point nanobar pressure also. But we are not uh, interested much to know about their response. We are only interested to know about our own auditory response. So there are two things here now. One thing is that the human ear responds to the sound in a logarithmic fashion. And next is there is something called threshold of hearing. Now there is a third thing called threshold of pain that I will show you in the picture now. You can see this picture. See, 0 0.0002 microbar, that is 0 0.2 nanobar of pressure, that is 0 dBs, that is called threshold of hearing. If any sound is below this particular pressure, we will not be able to hear this. Now, up to 10 dBs is fair sounds or paper rustling sound and up to 20 dBs is whispering sounds and up to 30 dBs is quiet office or computer's hard drive. Up to 40 dBs is the background music and up to 50 dBs is average residence or computer system. 60 to 70 dBs is average conversation or quiet music and uh, up to 80 dBs is orchestra or highway traffic or alarm clock. Up to 90 dBs is loud music, heavy truck, subway train. 100 dBs is very loud music, motorcycle. 110 dBs is health club, movie theater, chainsaw. 120 dBs is live music concert, iPods and MP3 players at full volume. You can see this much is called dynamic range. From 0 to 120 dBs is dynamic range where this 120 dBs is also called as threshold of pain. What do you understand by this? If at all we listen to a sound which is up to 120 dBs, then it means that the ear is going to indicate a pain. The brain is going to sense the uh, dangerous level of pressure and if the pressure exceeds then the eardrum may break out, eardrum may get permanently damaged. So that is why at that time at the ear you will have pain, the pain is induced. Now this human body is a very wonderful example of nature's one of the best systems where pain is not a disease. Pain is an indication of some disorder. Pain is the body giving you a signal that there is something wrong. For example, headache is not actually a disease. Headache is a disorder that in your body the energy level is less. So the body is telling you either take rest or take nutritious food, have some good exercise, good breathing exercise, increase the energy level of your body. That is what is the body telling you by inducing a pain. So, I will repeat here, pain is not a disease, pain is a disorder. But if the pain is ignored, then that may turn into a disease. Now, look at this threshold of hearing and threshold of pain. If any sound is beyond this 120 dBs, then definitely there is a serious damage to the eardrum. So, my dear students, you should be careful when you listen to music with the earphones inserted into your ears. See, 120 dBs is a live music concert or iPods and MP3 players at full volume. So, you should not listen to music, very loud music, very near to your ears. People... <laughs> People who work at uh, mines, 
people who work at uh, many such industrial uh, uh, atmospheres where there is always a lot of engine sound, they generally use an earplug all the way there. They always use an earplug there because there are some places where uh, sound is inadvertently going to happen, inadvertently going to happen. There are some uh, cranes working, let us say, and there are some machinery working whole day, let us say, or in the mines, continuous digging is happening, let us say. In such cases, uh, because of that particular activity, there is going to be a sound always. So, if the workers get exposed to this sound the whole day, naturally, after a few years, they will become deaf. Because what happens is, initially, there will be a threshold of pain. Ear keeps on indicating signal that there is pain, there is pain. If the pain, pain is ignored, then the ear may become permanently deaf, where the body will sense that pain was ignored. So, let me stop the inlet of the sound itself. So, the ear may become permanently deaf or eardrum may become permanently damaged. So, you should be careful when you listen to such sounds. There is a threshold of hearing, there is a threshold of pain. Now, above 120 dB, you can see jackhammer is 130 dBs, community siren is 140 dBs, and aeroplane, jet engine, they are all 150 to 160 dBs. So, if there is a jet engine working near you, or if there is an aeroplane uh, uh, engine making a lot of sound, the people who are sitting inside the aeroplane, they will not hear the sound because it is completely sealed. Even the windows are closed. But the people who are very much adjacent to the aeroplane, they will be listening to this particular sound, which is really a heavy sound. And such sound should not be heard for a longer period of time. So, this discussion is made just to indicate that the human ear is responding to uh, sound in a logarithmic fashion. That is why we have this dB, yes. And we have a threshold of hearing and we have a threshold of pain. So, when we design audio amplifiers, we should take care that any audio amplifiers output power should not exceed the threshold of pain. We have to take care. See, you can see iPods and MP3 players at full volume means that is designed for having a maximum output to only up to 120 dBs. Beyond that, even an audio amplifier should not be designed with the larger output power. Okay, let me go on to the next slide now. Ah, just a minute. You can see here 0 0.0003, 0.001, 0.003, 0.01, 0.03, 0.1, 0.03, 0.1, 0.3, 0.3, 0.3, 0.3, 0.3, 0.3, 0.3, 0.3, 0.3, 0.3, 0.3, 0.
Inductive loads are basically motors, generators, transformers. Such electrical appliances where electrical engineers use them for their modeling. But in our electronics applications, either it is another circuit which is made up of VJT at the output or it is another circuit major made up of JFET or MOSFET at the output. If it is JFET and MOSFET, it will be capacitance. If it is VJT, it can be resistance. Now, the right side circuit is relevant to the VJT amplifier circuit. Now, the left side, left side circuit, if at all we take a capacitive load as a MOSFET or a JFET at the next stage, and if at all we take the drain resistor, there is a resistor from the drain to the power supply, that we take it as this R, or even the output impedance, if we take it as R, then this can be applicable to the output side of the amplifier as well. So, we can have such these two circuits in many of our circuit modeling where we can have R in the beginning and C at the end or we can have C at the beginning and R at the end. You will study more about these circuits in the course network analysis where there can be multiple combinations of R, L, C. Here we are not considering L because our loads are not inductive loads as I have told you earlier. So, in such a case, we will keep coming across such uh, uh, circuits and we have something called time constant. Tau equals R into C. That is a time constant which means if at all a signal is coming here through R it is going to charge this C and C will take a finite time to reach to this VI because it is charging through R. At the same time if the input signal is going low now the C will discharge. When the C is discharging, again C is discharging through the R. So, the time taken for this capacitor to charge as well as to discharge will be same because it is through the R only it is charging, through the R only it is going to discharge. That is called as time constant, tau equals R into C. In the same way, you can see here there is this C and there is this R. Here this C may not be charging or discharging but the C will be passing the impulses to the other side. When it is passing impulse to the other side, at that time also, it can be R into C only. Let us say there is a sudden change at the input, that change will reflect at the output and it has to discharge through R only at the other side. So, that way, tau equals R into C is applicable to the circuit which is at the right side also. These are the two circuits which we will keep on uh, coming across or we will keep on using them in our circuit models many times. So, now if we apply sine wave to these circuits, then what will happen is the circuit which is at the left hand side will be lagging. That means output will be lagging from the input whereas the circuit which is the right hand side will be leading. More about uh, these leading, leading and lagging concepts you are going to study in the course called network analysis where we are going to measure the phase angle also there. I will not discuss much about this leading and lagging concepts here now because that is not the uh, discussion in this particular course. Okay. So, the circuit which is the left side is called lag circuit because output lags input. Circuit which is at the right side is called lead circuit because output leads input in terms of the phase, PHASE. Now, if we apply a square wave to the circuit which is on the left side, then it is called as integrating circuit. Why? If you apply a square wave, gradually, let us say this is going high, let us say it is going to 5 volts. It will take a finite time for C to reach 5 volts. So, until that time gradually the voltage at the output will slowly rise in a sinusoidal fashion, not actually in a pure sinusoidal fashion. Now, when the square wave goes to 0 here, now the same capacitor has to discharge through R to the other side. It will slowly discharge again in a non-linear fashion. That is why we use this E power plus x E power minus x. E power plus x is for charging, E power minus x is for discharging. In the mathematics, you must have used E power plus x, E power minus x for differentiation and integration so many times. 
now we are using that uh, factor e because now this is a non linear response between c and r it is slowly continuously rising up and it is slowly continuously coming down even the input is square wave output will not be a square wave so in the first case the output will be the integrated version of the square wave and in the second case output will be the differentiated version of the square wave so v not will be integral of vi in the first case v not will be differential of vi in the second case in the second case if at all a square wave goes there now 0 to 1 when it goes the capacitor's left side plate will be immediately charged to plus 5 volts if the signal is having an amplitude of plus 5 volts there is no resistance in series with the capacitor here so the capacitor's left side plate will immediately go to plus 5 volts but capacitor cannot pass dc to the other side but this change at the plate change at the first plate will reflect to some extent at the second plate so at the second plate or the right side plate of the capacitor there will be a sudden rise but when there is a sudden rise there is this r that sudden rise will be immediately discharged through this r so at the output you will simply get one impulse for a square wave you will get an impulse i will show you the waveforms later on it is there in my slide later on so now the right side circuit is called as a differentiated circuit in with respect to square wave now if at all we apply a sine wave to the input with the frequency now from 0 till infinity if we pass that frequency through the circuits what happens is now this first circuit is called as a low pass filter because at low frequencies the xc will be very high when frequencies increase the xc across the capacitance is very low so all the high frequency will be going to ground now when the all the high frequencies go to ground at the output you will not find any signal at high frequencies but at low frequencies you will find all those signals here so now we can say that this particular circuit is a low pass filter it is passing the low frequencies and the high frequencies will not be available at the output now this is single stage low pass filter when we combine one more stage it can be two stage low pass filter yesterday i was discussing about this thing only that single stage double stage triple stage filters so right now this is a low pass filter conversely at the right side whatever circuit you have if you apply a sine wave here capacitor will pass all the ac to the output right but at low frequencies x is high now the capacitor is in series so at low frequencies across the capacitance there will be drop across it because of the large value of reactance of the capacitance but at high frequencies x is 1 over 2 pi fc so all the high frequency will be passed to the capacitor to the output side and across this r the output is available so the circuit at the right side is called as high pass circuit or high pass filter it is passing the high frequency signals it is blocking the low frequency signals so it is called as a high pass circuit now as far as an amplifier is concerned now the left side circuit is a bypass circuit and the right side circuit is a coupling circuit i have already told you about this now the right side circuit is coupling circuit because this is a coupling capacitor this is the input impedance right similarly if you take the output side also at the output you have a coupling capacitor and you have a resistive load if at all you have a resistive load if you are using bjt itself then this is a coupling circuit at the input side also output side also but this is the circuit at the emitter at the emitter we have a bypass capacitor right and we have an internal resistance r between base and emitter we have an internal resistance and now through that internal resistance after the emitter we have this bypass capacitance so in case of an amplifier this left side circuit can be a bypass circuit all these circuits we are going to use later on when we model our amplifier in terms of low frequency as well as high frequency when we work out exercises on the low pass as well as high pass frequency response of an amplifier you will have to remember all these circuits because we are going to use them there let me proceed
Now you can see this particular circuit. Now this is a integrating circuit. You can see there. If at all the input signal is a square wave, slowly it will rise here because the capacitor is charging through R. And again, when it is going down, capacitor will discharge through the R. Again, slowly it will go down. Now, if the input synthetic signal is having a very high frequency, if the input is square wave, you will get output as a triangular wave. But if it is a low frequency, you will not get a pure triangular wave. You will get a slightly non-linear charging curve, slightly non-linear discharging curve. Let me annotate. Now, if it is a high frequency, then only you will get a output like this, which is a triangular wave. Otherwise, if the frequency is very low, you will get it something like this. You will get it something like this. Means, in a non-linear fashion, capacitor will charge. Again, in a non-linear fashion, capacitor will discharge. Now, here when you see a triangular wave, that is because when the time period is uh, really very large, large, no, not time period is very large. When the time period is very small or the frequency is very large, this minute continuous changes can be ignored at that time. That is why here it is shown as triangular wave. Now, when you apply integration for a square function, integral of the square function will be a triangular function. That is what is called as a integrating circuit. Now, let us come to the second circuit. You can see the second circuit here, where you apply a square wave. I told you that the capacitor will immediately get charged to this high value. And then there will be an impulse which is transferred to the other plate of the capacitor. But as there is this R at the other plate, what will happen is, you can see this. It will suddenly go up and it will slowly discharge. It will slowly discharge through R and it will come back to zero. Once it is completely discharged. See the left side of the plate will be having this maximum amplitude, but the right side of the capacitor, right side plate of the capacitor is going to be at zero value because of the R. Now when the signal goes back to zero, again there will be one more impulse, but now this impulse will be towards the negative side. And then it will come back to zero because even that negative waveform gets discharged through R to ground. So you can see the output, output is nothing but some pulses, whereas input is a square wave. Now, the differential of square wave is going to be this type of wave. It is an impulse. So now, whenever we have edge triggered circuits, we can use such impulses uh, for edge triggered circuits because this is now zero to high, zero to low, that way. We need not use this zero to uh, negative pulse, we will always use zero to positive pulse. So, this can be one triggering pulse, this can be one triggering pulse to the flip flops. That way, in case of flip flop, if at all we want to have directly edge triggered single stage flip flops, we can employ such circuits for edge triggering. Why should we go for edge triggering? Because during this level, there will be power consumption, right? We want the flip flop to work only during the rising edge. We uh, flip flop need not work at this particular level because flip flop is basically a memory element. Once it is triggered into a state, it will remain there until the next triggering happens. So until then, the pulse need not be having a continuous level. Otherwise, unnecessarily it is going to consume current. That is why we go for edge triggered circuits in digital electronics. So you can see these two circuits. One is called uh, RC, one is called CR, RC circuit is lag circuit, integrating circuit, low pass circuit and it can be bypass circuit in an amplifier. Whereas CR circuit is lead circuit, differentiating circuit, high pass circuit and it can be a coupling circuit in case of an amplifier. With these basics, now let us proceed further. Now, I will be continuing the discussion. If it was offline class, I would have been continuing with the chalk and talk because we will have some derivations and we will have some exercises now. But as it is an online class, now I will stop presenting this PPT and I will uh, start sharing 
my PDF where I have the notes written. Okay, let me proceed now. Uh, we had discussed the basics of decibels. We had discussed the basics of low frequency and high frequency analysis. Now, in this module, before proceeding further, we will have to discuss one more method of modeling of the transistor that is called as hybrid equivalent model. In the first module, we had modeled the amplifier circuits using a model called RE model. Initially, I discussed about T model and Pi model and the same Pi model later on we started calling it as RE model. Using that RE model, we had performed the AC analysis of the circuits. Now, in that RE model, we will have to find out the dynamic resistance of the emitter, right? by using a formula R e equals 26 millivolts divided by I e. That means that model depends on that emitter current. Instead, there is another model now here that is called hybrid equivalent model. And in this type of model, the manufacturer himself can give some parameters in the data sheets. Instead of V measuring the emitter current, then V calculating the value of R e then we applying it into our AC analysis, the manufacturer himself can give you these parameters and we can use those parameters for our AC analysis because the manufacturer knows better about the device which he is manufacturing. We only know about our circuits as such. So hybrid model is more accurate than our E model in the sense Hybrid model parameters are going to be given by the manufacturer himself, whereas the RE model is going to be uh, arrived at by the designers. So, let me discuss this hybrid equivalent model now. I will have to keep admitting the students. Fine. This model is defined in general terms for any operating conditions and is provided in the data sheets by the manufacturer. Look at this for any operating conditions. Whereas RE model, we used to apply it at the quiescent conditions. Whereas hybrid model can be used for any conditions. That is because it is accurately the parameters that are provided by the manufacturer himself. You can see this block here, where you can visualize this block itself as an amplifier and there is a common ground below and you have one input voltage VI, input current II, output voltage V0, output current I0. Now why the direction of the I0 is towards this side? That is because from collector to emitter current is flowing, we had used the minus sign earlier there. Now for the same reason, II input current is coming into the input port, again output current is going into the output port. Conversely, what we expect is that output current should come out of the output port. But here it is shown purposefully in this fashion because this is applicable to the common emitter configuration there. Where base to emitter also there is a base current, collector to emitter also there is a collector current because the emitter is grounded. That is why this figure is drawn this way. Now let me continue. Now the system equations for this two port network can be written like this. We can write it as VI equals H11 into II. Don't worry much about what is this 11 or don't worry much about what is this H. H stands for hybrid and 11 one one is with respect to port 1, port 1. 1, 2 is with respect to port 1 and port 2. So, VI can be H11 into II. There is some hybrid parameter H11. Later on, I am going to tell you differently about a naming for this hybrid parameters. Until then, you will have to wait. So, we can in general write this equation for the two port network. H11 into II 
plus h12 into v0. Now, when we say h12 into v0, that means we are establishing a relationship for the input voltage in terms of the input current and the output voltage. See, we have input voltage, input current, output voltage, output current. We can express these equations in many ways. For this purpose, we are choosing only V i and I naught. Input voltage in terms of input current and output voltage. Output current in terms of input current and output voltage. That is one way of defining. There can be multiple ways, right? There can be multiple ways. Here we are choosing specifically this particular method. Later on, you will know why we are choosing this particular method. So now, Vi equals H11 into Ii plus H12 into V0. Now you can immediately, immediately come to a conclusion. This is now voltage, right? If Vi is voltage, naturally it must be a sum of one voltage and another voltage, right? It must be a sum of one voltage and another voltage. So now, what should be H11? H11 must be some resistance because resistance into current is voltage, right? What is H12? H12 cannot be resistance, cannot be conductance. Why? H12 only has to be a multiplicative factor because there is V0. Now you understand H11 has to be a resistive parameter. H12 has to be only a multiplicative parameter because R into I is V and V into something is V. That way total it is V plus V is V. Voltage has to be voltage plus voltage. So now you understand why we discuss these as hybrid. We are modeling input voltage in terms of input current and output voltage. So H11 has to be a resistive counterpart and H12 has to be a multiplicative counterpart. Later we will give names for them. Now coming to I0. I0 is H21 into II plus H22 into V0. Now look at this. Current has to be a summation of one current and another current. So naturally H21 has to be a multiplicative counterpart. And what should be H22? H22 has to be a conductance now. Why? Conductance into V0 is I0 or V0 by R is I0, right? Voltage divided by resistance is current, right? So now, if there is a multiplicative factor called H21 here, then, sorry, H22 here, I am getting disturbed because of the students admitting and I, I keep admitting them, okay? H22 has to be now a conductance. H21 opposite of H12 need not be. H21 need not be opposite of H12. Why it should be? See, the first equation is expression in terms of voltage. Second equation is expression in terms of current. So, current into something is current only, no? Here, voltage into something is voltage. Here, current into something is current only. But H22 has to be conductance now. H11 has to be resistance now. Okay. Later on, we are going to give the names for all these four. Actually, we will be changing them from H11 to H122 to some other thing because we are going to relate this diagram now to the BJT circuit itself. So now, why this is H11? Because input current is at the first port itself. Why this is H12? Because the output voltage is the second port. Similarly, why this is H21? We are coming from the second port towards the first port where I, I is at the input port. Why this is H22? We are measuring at the output port itself. That is how we have named these parameters. Now we can say all these H11, H12, H21, H22 are hybrid parameters because they are all different. H11 is a resistive counterpart. H22 is a conductive counterpart. H12 and H21 can be a multiplicative counterpart or a divisive counterpart. It can be a uh, no, no, number also, it can be a fraction also. We don't know. Until we work it out, we don't know. Right. So, let me proceed now. 
the parameters relating the four variables i i i not v i v not are called as hybrid parameters because of the mixture of variables as i told you these are all mixtures they are not similar with each other at all that is when we call them as hybrid parameters and when we give a symbol h now in equation 1 if v not is set to 0 then h1 is v i by i i if v not is set to 0 if i i is set to 0, then h12 is v i by v0 when i i is 0. You can see this h12 is v i by v0, that is the ratio. h11 is v i by i i, that is the resistor. Okay. Similarly, in equation 2, if v0 is set to 0, h21 is i0 by i i when v0 is set to 0. So, this is again a ratio. It can be a multiplicative factor or it can be a dividing factor. If i i is set to 0, h2 is i0 by v0 when i i is set to 0. So, naturally h22 is conductive counterpart. I had already discussed this. Therefore, now we can write as h11 equals short circuit input impedance. Instead of h11, we will write it as short circuit input impedance. Why do we call it a short circuit? Because now we say what? i i is 0, v naught is 0, that means we are short circuiting. When we say i i is 0 means it is open circuit, v naught is 0 means short circuit. Just look at this, let me go back to the block diagram. If v naught is 0, then it is short circuit. If i i is 0, then we should say it is open circuit, no current is flowing in. So that way, actually we are not going to make any v naught or i i. 0 as such. Only for our sake of illustration, we are discussing this. So that we can name these parameters later on accurately. So, V0 is setting to 0 means it is short circuit. I i is setting 0 means it is open circuit. That way, H11 can be written as short circuit input impedance and H12 can be written as open circuit reverse transfer voltage ratio. And H21 can be short circuit forward transfer current ratio. And H22 can be open circuit output admittance. I was telling you H11 is a resistive counterpart whereas H22 is a uh, conductive counterpart. So, as it is at the input side, as H11 is at input side, we will simply write HI instead of H11 we will write hi indicating short circuit conditions. For h12, we will write open circuit reverse transfer voltage ratio. Why? You can see this here. It is vi by v0. vi by v0 means it is reverse way. It is reverse transfer, it is a voltage ratio. So, we will call it as open circuit reverse transfer voltage ratio and we will simply call it as hr. H21, we will again call it as short circuit forward transfer current ratio. Why? Why forward transfer current ratio? H21 is I0 by II. We are going from input to output in a forward direction. Whereas in the earlier case, we were going from output back to input. It was in the reverse way. So, it is I0 by II. So, H21 is short circuit forward transfer current ratio. We will call it as HF. And lastly, H22 we will call it as open circuit output admittance and we will call it as HO. Now look at this HI input, HR reverse, HF forward, HO output. This is how we rename now. Now we are relating this to our BJT circuit. Otherwise, when we gave this 11121122, it was for any general two port network. When we relate it to our electronic circuit, we can say HI, HR, HF, H0. Now, if at all we use a common emitter configuration, then we can easily write the same HI as HIE and HR as HRE, HF as HFE and HO as HOE. Remember this, 
Now, when our manufacturer gives HIE, then it is a common emitter input impedance. Okay. If at all he gives a HRE, then it is a common emitter reverse transfer voltage ratio. If at all he gives HFE, it is a common emitter forward transfer current ratio. And when he gives HOE, it is a common emitter output admittance. If the manufacturer gives us all these four factors, we don't have to find out RE now. What we did in the first module, we need not do. We can directly use these parameters in our AC analysis. That is the idea. Now, you may wonder why are you discussing this model now in the third module? The reason is our low frequency and high frequency analysis of the circuits, we are going to perform using the hybrid model itself because hybrid model is a standard model when compared to RE model. Why? Hybrid model is a model that is given by the manufacturer himself. So, there need not be any inaccuracies. Now, this model is not dependent on the designer. It is dependent on the manufacturer. That is why we are going to use hybrid model only. Otherwise, also everywhere in the industry, they are using hybrid model only. We discussed that RE model in the first module only because it is easy for you to understand the basics there at that time. Later on, you can easily understand hybrid model also. That was the intention when we framed our syllabus. So, HIE, input impedance, HRE, reverse transfer voltage ratio, HFE, forward transfer current ratio, HOE, output admittance. Now, I just want to tell you about this HFE. We had used this HFE earlier also. And we had given the beta also for the same thing, right? We had used beta only for the same thing. What is beta? Beta is a current ratio. So, beta is IC by IB. That is I naught by II, right? So, here also it is forward transfer current ratio. Here also it is I naught by II. Look at this. H21 is I naught by II. That is IC by IB. So, when manufacturer gives the HFE, that actually means beta only. So, remember beta and HFE are one and the same in the AC model. Beta can be AC beta also, DC beta also, right? There can be beta DC, beta AC also. At the quiescent conditions, we call it as beta AC only for the small signal analysis. When manufacturer gives HFE, that is nothing but beta AC only. So, that way we have HIE, HRE, HFE, HOE for common emitter configuration. We can have HIB, HRB, HFB, HOB for common base configuration. We can have HIC, HRC, HFC, HOC for common collector configuration. But we will be working more on common emitter only. So, that way we will be using HIE, HRE, HFE, HOE, HOE extensively. So now the hybrid model can be written. The hybrid model can be written in this fashion. We can write at the input HI because it is impedance. Then we have this reverse voltage transfer ratio, right? So we can write HR into V0 at the input. And at the output, we can write HF into II because this is a forward current transfer ratio. Forward current ratio, right? Next, finally, we have output admittance here. That is 1 over H0. Now, you can compare this with our RE model where we had instead of HIE, HI, we had beta into RE here. We did not have this block there. This HR into V0 block, we did not have. But we had this particular block there. That was beta into IB. And then we had one R0 there, output resistance. Now, instead of R0 here, this is 1 over H0 because here it is modeled in terms of admittance. So, the hybrid model can be compared with the RE model and we can have parallels there. Whatever is common in both of them, we can use it there. So, the similar model can be written for CE and CV configurations of VJT as follows. Now, this is for common emitter as I told you. We have HIE. 
H R into V C E. V C is the output voltage. H F E into I V and one over H O E. This is for common emitter model. Similarly, we can write it for common base model using a PNP transistors model. We can write a common base model where H I B H R B into V E B and then H F B into I E one over H O B. Okay. So let me stop here because I will discuss in much more detail about how to compare RE model and the hybrid model together and in what way we can have parallels. Uh, that takes a little more time so I don't want to do it in a hurry. So I am going to end this class now. In the next class I will discuss these things again in more detail. See you in the next class. Take care.